years, um, you know, had quite a high concentration of radon gas on the lower floors, basically because of that, you know, entrance of, of air coming in through on the ground floors. So sealing a building up is, is good in lots of ways, particularly in health, uh, uh, health terms related to radon gas. So um, the project I'm going to talk about is a multi-residential retrofit of a historic building built in 1954 in Barcelona. So this was basically um, a largely solid brick wall, uh, about 29 centimeters thick, with some artificial stone on some of the on some of the facades. So we couldn't insulate externally; we had to do everything internally. And um, solid brick walls, just as solid stone walls, quite complicated when you're insulating internally. Um, because uh, if they are subject to driving rain from the outside, moisture can be coming in continually um, due to uh, liquid transport in the, in the brick. And if you insulate a lot on the inside, it can be delicate in terms of um, moisture control, mold growth, condensation, and, and so on. So um, briefly, the air tightness strategy that we applied on the project was um, the whole building and per floor. So we had an airtight layer running around the external walls, um, also on the internal dividing walls, uh, which could connect us to the outside at these points. And although we were going to test the building, uh, the completed building just as one complete zone, we also did airtightness on a floor by floor level for two reasons. One was to reduce uh, acoustic uh, bridging and, and noise between different height, different flats, and the other was to facilitate preliminary air tightness testing on a floor by floor basis. So this is a great image, I think, by Joseph Little, which shows a little bit some of the complexity of insulating a solid wall. So, of course, if we put insulation on the inside face of a solid wall, be it brick or stone, we're reducing the temperature on the face of that wall because we're insulating it against the indoor heat in the winter. So. As we lower its temperature, then the hum relative humidity rises. And if we include a vapor barrier or a vapor check, we can also limit drying potential to the inside. Um, so the standard rule of, you know, put a vapor barrier in and put lots of insulation has to be kind of uh, looked at quite carefully in these walls because uh, obviously when it rains, these walls, the material itself acts like a sponge and moisture starts coming in. Uh, and if we have a vapor barrier here, we can end up trapping that moisture in there. So one of the things we looked at in this project was, do we want a capillary active vapor open strategy or do we want a vapor barrier? Do we want a vapor check? Do we want dynamic vapor control? So we looked at various different solutions and <clears throat> came up with a, one which was suited to the, uh, the project in question and the, and the local climate. So when looking at moisture control, we can look at materials and they can have different functions. You know, uh, a material can be airtight, it can be air permeable. It can be vapor permeable, or it can be vapor impermeable. Um, and it can be waterproof or not waterproof. And in any combination of those three, you know. So we have a range of uh, materials um, at our uh, fingertips, which we can use, be it plastic membranes, liquid membranes, um, gypsum plaster, and so on, which offer you know, different characteristics in that sense. So we did a whole lot of modeling for this project with the WUFI uh, dynamic uh, hydrothermal modeling package. Um, I'm just gonna present basically three that we kind of distilled um, because we discovered that um, using vapor barriers or vapor checks could be counterproductive in in this case for this building and in this, in this climate. So this is um, a simulation run over 10 years showing the relative humidity on the inner face of the existing brick wall with insulation applied. Okay, so this is the relative humidity year after year with peaks here of 90. Ideally, we wanna be below 80% to avoid creating an environment where uh, mold growth can occur. And of course, we never want to reach condensation. So this is just, um, internal gypsum plaster on this green line as an air tight la um, layer, but no vapor control. Um, 
this second blue line shows the same thing, but with the outer face of the brick treated with a water repellent treatment, which I'll talk about in a minute. But quite a good improvement there, peaks of 80% relative humidity because of this water repellent treatment on the outer face of the brick. And then just as a major comparison, what was going to happen, what would happen if we put a vapor check um, on the warm side of the insulation? What we found in the simulations was that, in fact, drying potential was reduced a bit and the peak relative humidity was, was higher. So um, the solution that we opted for basically was this one. Um, sorry, wrong, this one. <laughs> OK, we, uh, we went for a capillary active vapor open strategy uh, coupled with a water repellent treatment on the outer face of the brick, which is sometimes called brick cream. Um, I know that historic building specialists, and I'm sure that some of you here tonight sometimes uh, uh, may question the effectiveness of a solution like this, but this is basically a treatment which, you know, is like a Gore-Tex. Um, it reduces the, uh, by about 90%, the water absorption of a brick, but it maintains its vapor permeability. Um, so it's quite interesting for solid walls in historic buildings in which you can only insulate internally, which are exposed to driving rain. Yeah, so it stops the, you know, the amount of water getting in uh, through liquid uh, transport, but it means that the, 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 the wall can still uh, release water vapor. So of course, a lot of this analysis is really dependent on climate. This is just quickly a profile of the temperatures we have in Barcelona. It doesn't really get very cold when it gets to about nought degrees here. In Barcelona, everything just sort of stops and people start burning their furniture to stay warm and stuff. Whereas in, in New York, you you know, you get down to minus 15 and everybody's still kind of happy. So this is quite different, um, uh, different climates which need different solutions. So um, one of the main things we need to look at if we're using internal insulation on solid walls is the, the driving rain. So this is the climate file for Barcelona, which shows 500 mil uh, a year of, of uh, rain, whereas in the New York, almost double that. So any wall, for example, which is going to be facing northeast or east in New York um, is going to be subject potentially to lots of driving rain. So those are the ones we need to be particularly careful at with uh, and look at that in, in, um, in the design phase. So just to summarize quickly, what we found was that internal insulation of solid walls is tricky. You need to um, look at each one as a case by case basis. There's no one size kind of fits all. Um, clearly in cool temperate climates, a lot of the climates that you have uh, in North America, um, you know, internal vapor checks and or vapor barriers are, are often gonna be needed, but it's important that they don't also reduce the drying potential to the inside. Um, of a solid wall, be it brick or stone. So um, important to look at each each enclosure uh, on, a, on a project by project basis. If possible, measure the water absorption of your existing wall, be it solid bricks or stone, um, and look at the, the the robustness of your solution with with transit tools, if possible, woofy delf and, and so on. Uh, the glazer method, you know, the simplified method for um, condensation analysis is probably far too simplified in the case of these these kind of solid walls with internal insulation so and of course it's always uh, good to be able to monitor performance and learn and improve along the way so the air tightening strategy we applied in this project was just as i said very simple uh, chips and plaster applied on the inner face of the existing brick wall the ground floor we had a liquid membrane sprayed onto the terrazzo floors um, and the join was with uh, airtight paint. Um, on intermediate floors um, we also applied the liquid membrane on the floors and then the gypsum plaster on the walls. Insulation was sprayed cellulose um, between uh, galvanized steel profiles and uh, plasterboard. The profiles were brought in from the wall slightly to avoid thermal bridging and make sure the insulation could get in there. Um, and then we had uh, bone glass insulation on the, on the floors. 
so um, there was already already some existing plaster on the inner face of the brick walls that was all cleaned off and then replastered. So it was a solution that um, you know the local uh, uh, tradespeople knew well, and um, it was applied at reasonable cost. And we also did all of the internal walls as well uh, to avoid any leaks going uh, through to the outside walls. This is some images of the liquid membrane on the ground floor and intermediate floors. Given the results that we got on the blower door test, we could have probably done without uh, the liquid membrane on the intermediate floors. Um, uh, you know, and, and some cost savings would have been possible there, but uh, this is a solution we applied, which then was just uh, sprayed on the, on the joint with the, with, the, um, with the walls to seal them. Service penetrations, of course, will serve sealed um, with uh, plaster and airtight paint. This is a kind of picture of how not to do um, service penetrations of lots of pipes. You know, ideally you want to separate them, get a, enough space to get in there with tapes or with, with airtight paint. Unfortunately here we couldn't because there was literally no other way we could get all of these pipes in. So they actually, behind the, 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 the render that you can see there, all of the pipes came through a pre-cut polystyrene XPS board, which was previously sealed. So anyway, we had to keep on top of all of the service penetrations, cables for the um, motors of the blinds as well. Um, and there you go. So this is just a few images of the insulation system, which was sprayed cellulose internally, um, which is an interesting um, solution because you get a homogenous complete covering layer of insulation important to do it in the summertime or the warmer months because obviously there's quite a lot of liquid in the cellulose once it's applied um, and uh, if you then seal everything up in the winter when it's all wet you could uh, have a few moisture problems so recommendable to do this in, in the warmer months if possible. Um, the windows um, we had them factory uh, we had the blind casings fixed to the window frames in the factory and they were delivered on site like this. So the, the, the window frames and the, and the blind casings were all delivered on site together, which was a real, uh, which was a great solution because it just saves lots of headaches in terms of air tightness through, through these blind casings, which is essential in warm climates, you know, to have some, some shading. Uh, the windows were fixed with uh, metal steel brackets to the inner face of the wall, air tight tapes. Um, and of course, they were the windows were, were basically installed in the insulation layer to the inside, so reducing the the uh, thermal bridge installation coefficient. So here you can see a kind of wood fiber and polyurethane uh, board to hold the sit the window on. These steel brackets obviously uh, point thermal bridges, but um, but a good solution. And the airtight tape here, tape to the gypsum plaster. So the airtight tape was put on before the brackets and then fixed to the wall and, and, and taped. Important to get some um, primer on the walls before you tape so that everything sticks nice and well. So we did the airtightness testing um, on all of the three floors of the upper three floors of the building. Here you can see some of the smoke coming in from the handheld smoke generator. So there was a bit of leakage through the uh, window uh, seals here. You know, um, but really it wasn't significant because the results were very good. But uh, one of the great things about this famous blower door test is that you can really uh, see what's happening. And um, and in the preliminary test with the smoke, you can correct things if need be. And I think it's a great way for everybody, trades, project design people, uh, to sort of understand what uh, what the scope of the the challenges and, 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 and what works and what doesn't. So here's a few images of the blower door machine, which are, uh, many of you will probably have already seen. You know, it's a machine that pressurizes or depressurizes the building. It means you can measure the amount of air uh, coming in and coming out. We had a couple of guys hanging out the windows with the smoke generators. Um, and the results were really good. On the first floor, we got 0.36 uh, air changes per hour, 50 pascals. So quite far below the requirement for passive house. New build, 0.31 on the second floor, 0.47 on the third floor, a few more leaks to the roof. So um, 
really good results, sort of uh, well below the, the, the limit for passive house retrofit. Um, and just finally, a quick look at what the impact of air infiltration is on the energy consumption of this building. So these are modeled uh, energy consumption for heating, cooling, hot water, and electricity of the existing building with 10 air changes per hour. And then um, the energy demands if we reduce air tightness to 0.6. So 37% savings just because of air tightness in the Barcelona climate. So clearly if you're in Northern Canada, uh, those savings are gonna be far, 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 far greater. You know, in Barcelona, we don't have very, very harsh winters. In euros, um, at an electricity cost of 19 cents per uh, kilowatt hour, the savings for this building is in the region of 9,000 euros a year for the whole building. So even in the Barcelona climate, reducing air tightness to passive house levels is, has a, an economic rationale. And of course, other many more important ones to do with health, comfort, uh, reduction in uh, pathologies and, and moisture problems and so on. So, that's pretty much it. Um, thanks a lot for for um, for your time. Here's my contact details, and I hope uh, we can have some questions at this time.